fried chicken should be crisp on the outside and moist on the inside. And it can be made easily at home if you have the right tools. Cast iron skillet, a frying thermometer, a pair of tongs, a meat thermometer, instant read, very, very essential, and some buttermilk, flour, cornmeal, and some spices. I'll show you how to make the best fried chicken right in your own kitchen. Once a year, I have a fried chicken dinner at my house, and I do the chicken in batches. Uh, all the chicken, and these are small chickens called fryers, two and a half to three pounds each, are cut up into um, eight or ten pieces each, and I soak them in ice water overnight in the refrigerator, and then I make the buttermilk marinade. And the chickens have to stay in the buttermilk for four hours minimum in the refrigerator. Buttermilk lends a subtle tanginess to the chicken because it contains lactic acid. And it also has a, a nice tenderizing effect on proteins. It also helps the chicken remain moist and juicy. So this is one chicken cut up. It's been soaked in salted ice water. And add to that four cups of buttermilk. You can also take good organic whole milk and add to one quart, you can add about three tablespoons of cider vinegar. Uh, wait for a little while and you have something resembling buttermilk. Two tablespoons of salt, one teaspoon of black pepper, and one and a half tablespoons of dry mustard. Adds a good sharpness to the mix and one teaspoon of cayenne kind of wonderful ingredient. And just mix this all up. The chicken's gonna stay in here, as I said, four hours or up to overnight. Cover with a bit of plastic wrap and put into the refrigerator. So now one hour in advance of frying, remove the chicken from the marinade onto a rack. Let the chicken dry on the rack for one hour. Now this has been dried, you can see it's still tacky, but much drier than this chicken. And now for the dry coating. One and a half cups of all-purpose flour. And I'm just using a bag, this is so easy. And th two or three tablespoons of yellow cornmeal. Cayenne pepper, oh like half a teaspoon. And one teaspoon of black pepper. This is very similar to what my friends down in Amarillo, Texas coated their chicken with and one teaspoon of salt. Shake this up and now drop the chicken in. So put three or four pieces of chicken in the bag and shake. nicely coated. And when I was making fried chicken for great big crowds, I would do lots and lots of chickens. And you see how nicely the flour is adhering? Putting the pieces into the flour is called dredging. So even though the flour is sticking, the chicken's not wet. Now there's plenty of flour in here that can be used to coat that other chicken, but it has to dry for one hour. Set that aside and we're ready to fry. If the oil is the right temperature, don't fry if a cube of bread doesn't turn golden brown in a minute or less. But my thermometer is telling me at 330 degrees that it's not quite ready. 340, oh, we're getting ready. So put the dark meat in first. Wear covered shoes and an apron. Now, just take your thermometer out of the oil and cover this for four minutes on each side. 
and really pay attention to the timing. Uh, this method of frying is called shallow frying. The best pan is this cast iron skillet with the cover. I love this pan, and it really does conduct the heat very, very nicely, and it holds the heat more effectively than other types of skillets. At tag sales, you can find these pans with the covers, and that's the best cast iron because it is uh, already aged and uh, has a beautiful patina. Oh, it looks so good. Looking good. Now here's some things to keep in mind when frying. If the oil is not hot enough, the food will absorb too much of the fat. But if the oil is too hot, the surface of the food will burn before it cooks on the inside. So keep the temperature pretty constant. Keep extra vegetable oil at room temperature nearby. And if the oil in the pot gets too hot, you can cool it down by adding some of this room temperature oil. Not cold oil, but room temperature. And the chicken pieces in the pan should not be touching. Thighs and legs should register 165 degrees, and white meat, the breast meat, uh, should register 160 in the thickest part. Well, the first chicken's all done, and now I've started frying the second. It certainly looks delicious. Fried chicken. Now we're gonna make a cross between a cake-like cobbler and a traditional fruit crumble. It's called a buckle, and it's a perfect way to showcase the juiciest of summer stone fruits. In this recipe, I'm using juicy, sweet, luscious peaches. And for this recipe, we're using three peaches cut into thin slices, say a quarter of an inch. The late summer fruits for the nectarines and the peaches and a lot of the plums come free stone, which is very nice so that you can easily cut neat slices away from the pits. We're baking this in a 10 inch enameled cast iron skillet. You can use a stainless steel skillet if you don't have a cast iron skillet. And I'm melting a half a cup of butter, one stick of unsalted butter. That's gonna go into the buckle batter. So just finish this peach. Beautiful and really fragrant and sweet peaches. I'll sprinkle two tablespoons of sugar over the fruit. And you can just toss this a little bit. And now to make the batter, it's all done in a bowl. So we'll need one cup of all-purpose flour into your bowl two teaspoons of baking powder. There are many different summer desserts, crisps, buckles, pan dowdies, crumbles, one cup of sugar, a pinch of salt, Betty's, grunts, sonkers, all of those funny names are all similar kinds of crumble desserts with fruit. So we've whisked all the dry ingredients, add one cup of milk, a teaspoon of good vanilla, vanilla extract, and the melted stick of butter. And we're gonna put this right back in here so that is our buttered pan. Just stir this. It's a thin batter. And you can pour this mixture right back into the hot pan and top with your cut peaches. So this goes right in. So no eggs, simple, simple. And put your fruit in a even a layer as possible. Uh, right into the batter. This is a delicious dessert. I would scrape out any excess sugar, because this is all the sugar you get, except for a little sanding sugar on top. And 
and sprinkle with this sparkling sanding sugar. Gives a little bit of glisten. Make sure your oven's preheated to 350 degrees. Bake until the top is golden brown and a tester inserted into the center comes out clean. 50 or 55 minutes. So you can see why it's called a buckle. The crust has buckled in several places. It's crispy, glistening because of the addition of that wonderful sanding sugar. I love sanding sugar. I use it on the tops of things like this, but also on the tops of uh, the crusts of a two crust apple pie, peach pie. And take a wedge of this. You can see how it's laden with fruit. And serve this with a dollop of creme fraiche. You can whip this with a little bit of sugar if you like, or just plain. I like it plain, and I like a lot of it. Mm. Looking at this, I think that buckle may become your favorite simple stone fruit dessert. Enjoy. I cook with corn all summer. I love it steamed with butter and salt. I love to prepare it like they do in Mexico with chili and lime and cheese. And I also love to make corn fritters. So first, you need two cups for corn fritters of corn removed from the cob. Husk the corn, take off all the silk as much as you can, and then with a very sharp knife on a cloth lined tray as I'm doing, strip the kernels from the cob. Now the kernels from one regular ear of corn like this should equal approximately one cup of corn kernels. So let's see. You need two cups of corn kernels for this particular recipe. Mm, very close. And see how easy it is if you do it on a cloth like this to just sort of pick them up and put them where you want them. There. Certainly is just about one cup. So here's our two cups of corn. I've already done one ear. Reserve this one for the second batch. And it's funny thing with fritters and pancakes, there's always a second batch. Now there's no correlation, by the way, between the corn's color, which is derived from carotene, and its sugar content. But I must tell you, the fresher it is, the faster you cook it, the sweeter and better it will be. And people's preferences for corn color are largely based on where they come from and what they ate as a child. For instance, New Englanders generally prefer yellow corn or butter and sugar corn, which is that nice bicolor variety. This is a butter and sugar corn. And Californians usually favor white corn. Uh, we're using butter and sugar today. So we have egg, one egg. I'm making the batter now. Break up the egg. And the egg gets mixed with one tablespoon of sugar. Two tablespoons of cornmeal. Cornmeal adds a nice crunchiness to your batter. Three quarters of a cup of unbleached flour. One and a half teaspoons of coarse salt. One and a half teaspoons of baking powder. Quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. And a half a cup of milk. This is a stiff batter. You don't want a very wet batter because you're going to be dropping this batter with the corn in it into the hot safflower oil, which is heating on the stove right now. Better adjust the temperature. Let's see. We're up to 330. So adjust the flame so that the oil comes up to about 375. During cooking, the oil temperature should be around 360 degrees. It does cool off as you add your batter. So add your two cups of corn kernels. And easy as corn fritters, you have a very nice, light, fluffy batter. And this is ready to drop into the hot oil as soon as it reaches temperature. And I found that using an ice cream scoop makes nice round fritters. You can use, if you don't have one, this is a, a small one. It's about a tablespoon and a half size. If you don't have one of these, you can use two spoons and push it off two spoons. 
Okay, so now our temperature has just reached 375, and I'm going to use this little scoop, and you just plop it right in. Do it in small batches because you don't want to lower the temperature of the oil too much. But you see how easy it is to use this instead of two spoons, and it really does free up your other hand. Be careful not to drop it in. You don't want to splatter the oil. You want to be very careful. Have a piece of paper towel on a platter ready to take the fried fritters as soon as they come out of the oil, but they're turning a beautiful golden brown in just a matter of a minute or two. This kind of Chinese spider is a very, very good tool for deep frying like this. It does enable you to lift and not take too much oil with it. And you can really smell the corn. Those kernels of corn are cooking right in the pretty fritter. So isn't that a pretty sight? I'll put one more batch in. This is a handy tool. I don't know if you know what this is, but that's a splatter guard, just to keep the oil from splattering all over you. Little nubbins of corn. So if you start with oil that's 375 degrees, I would try to keep it at around 370 throughout the cooking process for good golden brown fritters that are cooked through and through in just a couple of minutes. So these cute little fritters can be served as a snack, as a side dish, and they can also be served as a first course. So we're getting about 26, that's pretty good. Arrange the drained fritters on a platter, heated platter, and serve these piping hot. They don't get better as they sit out. They don't taste as good as when they are pretty hot. Golden balls of delicious seasonal corn. Serve them with honey and a little bit of sea salt. Really delicious. I'm sure when many of you think of creamed corn, it brings back memories of something that can easily come from a can. But this popular side dish was common in the American Midwest long before it became an American canned staple. Made with fresh corn kernels and cream, this homemade creamed corn is nothing like the canned version. And uh, it's very easy to make. So I'm just finishing cutting off the kernels from eight years of corn. And as soon as I'm done with this, take the pulp from the cob with the edge of a spoon. What comes out from each and every one of these little indentations is what's known as corn milk. And just scrape it like this. So you can see that's what corn milk is. Put that right in with the kernels. It's very flavorful, very tasty, it's sweet, and adds a great, great flavor that the kernels alone just can't match. So this is an essential part of the traditional American creamed corn. All this gets added to the bowl. And in a big skillet, saute in some butter, four tablespoons of butter, one onion, finely chopped. So just start the onions cooking a little bit. Then add your corn kernels and corn milk and one cup of water. Let this cook for approximately 20 minutes. Now add one cup of water. Bring that water to a boil and it'll come to a boil rather quickly. Reduce it to a simmer and cover and cook until the corn is very tender, 25 to 30 minutes. And don't discard those cobs. Turn that into your wonderful corn stock. Very, very easy, as I showed you. Onion, corn cobs, and water. It's boiling, reduce it to a simmer. Cover and cook. Now this has been cooking for 20 minutes. It looks very pretty. 
add one and a half cups of heavy cream. This is not diet food, but it is good food. Bring this to a boil and cook until the mixture thickens. While that's happening, you can add one teaspoon of sugar, oh, about a half a teaspoon of salt, and a quarter of a teaspoon of black pepper. So no bechamel, no flour, nothing but corn to thicken corn. And I think this with a pork roast with a nice big pork chop. Remember, most of the corn in the United States is grown in Iowa, where there's also a lot of pork, and that's where they make a lot of creamed corn. Very, very delicious. Serve it piping hot, and it really is best just served immediately after making. It takes about four to six minutes for this to thicken up. You can use some of this creamed corn poured into the center of a cornbread before you bake it. It adds an extraordinary texture. And you can also probably turn this creamed corn into a very nice corn pudding with the addition of egg and grated cheese. Uh, adjust the seasoning to your liking. There, this is nice and thick. And it looks really, really different than the version that comes from the can. So there, I think that's cooked enough. Ladle that into your serving dish. And serve. Creamed corn, an American classic. Layer cakes took the South by storm shortly after the Civil War, when the first published recipes began appearing in books and newspapers. This caramel cake, with its irresistible combination of tender vanilla cake layers and rich frosting, soon became a Southern favorite. In the bowl of a stand mixer, put two sticks of unsalted butter. Room temperature butter, look how easily it beats. Add one cup of granulated sugar. This is a sweet cake, as you will see. And two cups of dark brown sugar. Pack the sugar. And one, get that going. And a second cup. There, and let that get nice and creamy. And we're going to add six eggs, one at a time. And there goes the sixth. Add to this mixture one tablespoon of the best vanilla you can find. While this beats, three cups cake flour, not the self-rising kind. We're adding our own leavening agents. A half a teaspoon of baking soda, and a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. Turn the mixer on low. And we have a cup of sour cream already measured. Alternate the addition of flour and cream. So add every little bit of your sour cream. And then finish up with your flour. So this makes two eight inch layers. The pans have been buttered, lined with parchment in the bottom, and then buttered again and floured. Try to divide as evenly as possible. Quickly press the batter with an offset spatula like this. And now we can put these right into a 325 degree oven, preheated until a toothpick comes out clean. That'll take 50 minutes and I'm baking right in the middle of the oven. And now for the filling that makes this caramel cake a caramel cake. In a small saucepan, I've put a half a cup of sugar and I am heating it over a low flame so that it just starts to get a little bit of an amber color. And in this saucepan, two cups of granular sugar and one cup of heavy cream.
and two tablespoons of unsalted butter. And you can add the butter here too and turn your heat on to kind of medium. Oh, look how this sugar is melting. Ah. And what I'm going to do is add this cream mixture to our simple sugar mixture, stirring all the time. Just add this to this. And that is going to be our beautiful caramel mixture. Stir all together. See that lovely caramel color? Get this on medium-high heat, watching so that it does not overboil. The mixture is now at softball stage 238 degrees. Remove your candy thermometer. This thermometer is going to go down the side of the bowl and this mixture is going to be poured right into the bowl. What we really want to do is cool this mixture to 200 degrees. That's going to take approximately 20 minutes. At 200 degrees, and use the flat beater, and while beating, add one teaspoon of the very best vanilla. It's going to take about six minutes to get thickened. And so this looks exactly right. Turn it off and just leave it in this bowl until it really cools. So now for the caramel whipped cream frosting. In a saucepan, add a half a cup of sugar and two tablespoons of water. Add a pinch of salt. Now over medium high heat, melt the sugar in that little bit of water and cook until a beautiful amber color is achieved. That'll take a few minutes. Ah, beautiful. What a lovely amber. I'm going to turn the heat off while I add my heavy cream. And just add the cream very slowly. It has a tendency to bubble up. You can see it bubbling up. And once it cools the caramel, stir. So now we have a lovely caramel colored cream. Turn the heat back on and cook until all the caramel is melted into the cream. And now the cream has to be chilled very cold uh, before you can whip it. And what I like to do is just cool it right in an ice bath like this. Let it sit, just stirring it occasionally now our filling is cool and we have to cut this into thirds. And once you've apportioned your filling, you can just roll it into each piece into an eight inch circle. These are actually getting very soft. You could put this in the refrigerator just for a moment to firm up a little bit. But there's one eight inch and proceed to get all three done. And now the cake itself. As it baked, it kind of went over the edge a little bit. Cut these edges off. They're too crispy. Don't throw them away. Eat the scraps. So that's one layer. And trim the second layer. And you take off this rough top layer, which is almost like a cookie, so dole it out. Now cut this layer into two rounds. And it's really best to turn the cake and make sure your knife that's cutting is halfway through the layer. Very nice. And then you can lift this layer to the rack. And now repeat and do the same thing. And now we're ready to apply our caramel filling. Take this over and lay it on. And release the parchment paper. And I would just fold under the edge. And then your next layer 
and the last layer of caramel. And the caramel whipped cream is whipped and staying chilled in the refrigerator. Top this with the last layer, ready to frost. So that's the color of the whipped cream. I love the texture, I love the taste. We want to make sure the sides get covered. Take the cream down the sides. This spreads beautifully. And when this is put into the refrigerator, don't fret because it does get a little darker in color. The caramel looks more like caramel. I think that's beautiful. Now just release the papers. And all the mess that's on the paper would have been on the cake stand. And there you have the caramel cake. Must refrigerate it at least 30 minutes before serving, or you can keep it in the refrigerator for up to two days. Once you taste this amazing cake, you'll know why it has stood the test of time. You don't have to be a southerner, I found out, to enjoy grits. Now becoming more popular around the country and in top restaurants, this southern staple is enjoyed in numerous forms. Today, we have a very simple recipe that features smooth, creamy grits topped with broiled tomatoes and bubbling cheddar cheese, and if you'd like, some crispy bacon. And I'm just slicing two tomatoes. I'm making six ramekins with this recipe six individual servings. And these tomatoes, I'm gonna just put under the broiler to get cooked. I love broiled tomatoes and make them even tastier by putting a little bit of pepper on top, a little bit of salt and a drizzle of olive oil. Just a teeny, teeny bit of olive oil. And these will cook slowly under a hot broiler. Now, in this skillet, Two thick slices of bacon, just cut into little half inch squares. They'll cook and get crispy. Cooking grits is really easy. Grits are simply dried corn or hominy, a type of corn treated with an alkali and coarsely ground. This actually is a rather fine coarseness and this is white corn. White corn and yellow corn have negligible differences in sweetness and nutritional content, but white is generally favored in the South. When cooking grits, make sure your water is really boiling and use a whisk. Pour the grits in slowly, gradually, and keep stirring so that you don't have any lumps. So one cup of grits to four cups of boiling water. And keep an eye on the heat. If the pot gets too hot, the grits will burn and that is not what we want. Now just sprinkle this in and stir. I have watched lots of people make grits, and it's very easy to do. Grits like this will take about five minutes. Gradually thickens. Now you can use crumbled bacon, and crumbled bacon is thin slices of bacon cooked, and then you can crumble those. But if the bacon is thickly sliced like this bacon, it's a little hard to crumble it. And don't buy pre-cooked bacon bits. There is no reason to do that. Fresh grits will last several months in your pantry if you keep them in the freezer in a tightly sealed bag. I keep them actually in quart plastic containers. To the grits, you're gonna add two tablespoons of butter, two generous tablespoons. And then to make these cheesy grits, add one and a half cups of grated cheddar. Now, as you add the cheddar, use a wooden spoon, not the whisk, because the whisk will get all stuck. And stir this. It'll melt right into those grits, making them very, very cheesy. Now, I had added no salt, no pepper, so right now I'm going to add a goodly sprinkling of salt and a smaller sprinkling of pepper. There's the tomatoes. They've just gotten a little bit of color around the edge. Those are going to go on top of the grits. And the grits with the cheese and the butter can sit for a little while. If you want to keep it uh, longer than, oh, half an hour or so, I would put that in a bain-marie of hot water. 
so that they will stay warm. So here is our bacon. Just drain it on a piece of paper towel, a brown paper bag, and now it's time to fill buttered ramekins. Butter because you don't want the grits to stick, and you also add a little bit more flavor to the grits. Okay, I think those are nicely buttered. And spoon in your grits. Mmm, they look good. Now grits like this can be served for breakfast. You could put a little pile of grits on a plate and put a fried egg on top and a piece of country ham. That'd be good. Or you can make it a little fancier as I'm doing in a ramekin and this can be served uh, not only for breakfast but also for lunch. I really got to know a little bit more about grits when I visited my friend Sally down in Tennessee, and she took me to several wonderful stone mills that ground their own grits. It was just amazing to see corn being transformed from the kernel into a grain like this. So just clean up the edges a little bit and put your sliced tomatoes right on top. One has to be vegetarian. Actually, I'll make two vegetarian, and the rest can have a sprinkling of this delicious smoky bacon. Mmm, these look really good. Then, grate a little bit more cheese. This is the white cheddar. And sprinkle on top of the tomatoes just a half a cup or so. And these will go back under the broiler for approximately two minutes. Watch them carefully. This is oven proof where the dishes themselves, but you don't want anything to happen to them under a hot broiler. Hmm, I think these look good. And just a little bit of pepper. I love pepper. Cheddar's salty enough so you don't have to add any more salt. So, under the broiler for two minutes. I hope you'll try this recipe. They're ready. Bubbling, very hot. Oh my gosh, these look great. Spectacular. Now let them cool a little bit before you try to move them. But these are ready to eat in the next five minutes. Shrimp boils are very popular in Southern cooking and make for a delicious one pot meal. Shrimp boils are really indigenous to the low country of South Carolina, whereas crayfish or crawfish are a Louisiana specialty. But we're gonna do a shrimp boil today since that's the subject of our uh, show and uh, we have to make a fragrant kind of broth first. Some lemons and squeeze in two lemons into five quarts of boiling water and just add the peels too. You want the flavorful, flavorful boiling liquid if you can possibly get it. Oh, four cloves of garlic peeled and smashed, two medium or large onions peeled and put right into the water and uh, just bring it to a simmer. So the key to this authentic and delicious shrimp oil is to create a spicy brew in which to cook the shrimp. You can buy some really great combinations of spices and just dump them in here. But if you wanna make your own, uh, here is a good way to start. Um, we're going to start with a tablespoon of red pepper. I'm making a cheesecloth bundle and uh, we have a tablespoon of mustard seeds couple bay leaves. Crushed, they'll, uh, they'll equal about a tablespoon. And uh, six whole allspice berries. Three tablespoons of coriander seeds. And one tablespoon of dill seed. Now that'll give you a nice fragrant mix. And if you like, you can 
sort of crush all this a little bit with a big fat rolling pin. Okay, I think that will be a fragrant mix. Tie this like this to seal in all those spices and then secure it with a piece of twine and drop it into the water. So now we're ready to start cooking three pounds of small potatoes, little potatoes. All those spices and the onions and the lemon will infuse the water. Now bring this to a boil, reduce the heat to a simmer, and simmer for 10 minutes. So I am shucking some corn, about eight or 10 ears are good. And we're going to put it right into a very fragrant potato boil. Uh, they've been cooking for 10 minutes. Take a peek of very nice, yum. Uh, get as much of the silk off the corn as you can and just break it in half. And the corn has to go in now for five minutes. And I'll bring that up to a boil again and boil partially covered for five minutes. I'm melting some butter and just mixing it simply with my favorite hot sauce. Look at the great color that corn is becoming. Butter and sugar corn. And uh, now add your shrimp, three pounds, tails on, shells on, and make sure they get submerged in the broth. Very important. Cover again, partially. And I think our butter is melted, yes. two ramekins of the spicy butter. That smells really good. So now our shrimp boil is done and I am straining some of this broth through a fine sieve. And it's nice to serve that too in ramekins around the shrimp boil itself. So a shrimp boil like this is perfectly suited for casual outdoor entertaining. Spread your table with newspaper, uh, find some paper napkins and some bibs and feed that crowd. Shrimp America's most popular seafood is so versatile and you can serve it as you can see with as a shrimp cocktail, as scampi, as grilled shrimp or boiled shrimp. And these recipes will certainly delight. Now, this is okra. It's known as a southern favorite, but the rest of America is beginning to catch on to this delicious vegetable. Today, I'm gonna to show you one of the most common and best ways to cook it. If you've never tried okra before, this is a great recipe. Now, it's essential that you get okra that is tender, uh, very nicely colored, no brown spots. It shouldn't be shriveled and it shouldn't be dry. And it should also be able to be cut easily with a knife. If the knife is offered any resistance whatsoever by the okra, that is way too old to cook. So just discard that. Now um, remember, uh, after you wash it, dry it very, very well, pat it dry. I buy okra in the farmer's market, um, or I get it right out of my garden. It's a beautiful plant. It's related to the hibiscus family, and the flowers are very hibiscus-like. They are also edible. Uh, now to prepare for frying, just cut off the tops, the stem end like this, and cut the okra into half-inch pieces. You see how easily this is cut? These little tips, well, they're not right for frying, so I just kind of discard those or add them to the stock pot. I like okra stewed, I like it in gumbo. But this is something that you'll all enjoy, fried okra coated in a cornmeal and served with a remoulade sauce. So here we have our okra already cut up. I have three egg whites in this dish and I'm going to thin those with three tablespoons of cold water. Whisk this up, just break up the egg whites. And the oil is a vegetable oil. Uh, you could use olive oil if you like the taste of olive oil. You could use canola or just a good quality vegetable oil. 
So get this a little frothy. And I suggest, well, you have to use your fingers, so I suggest using one hand for the wet and one hand for the dry. In the cornmeal, uh, this is one cup of beautiful cornmeal. A quarter cup of flour is added to that. Use an unbleached flour. Half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, ground at, uh, as a little zip. And black pepper, a quarter of a teaspoon. And two teaspoons of salt. I think this kind of fried food needs salt. And this is not greasy fried food. This is like a, a little snack. So that's ready for dipping. OK, so we're working with a small amount of okra first. Just push this around in the egg white mixture, egg white and water. And then just place it in the cornmeal. And the oil should be heated to 375 degrees. So this looks good. Now you can just put all your coated okra onto a piece of parchment paper and drop these into the hot oil. Now these are browning very nicely, very quickly. These are done. Such a beautiful golden color. Just remove them to a paper towel covered baking sheet and start frying the next batch. I'll show you how easy it is to make a very flavorful remoulade. To one cup of mayo, you can use low fat mayo if you want or homemade mayo. Add one tablespoon of finely chopped parsley a tablespoon of finely chopped basil leaves, two tablespoons of milk, which thins out the mayonnaise a little bit, quarter of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, two teaspoons of finely chopped shallot, some salt, two um, tablespoons of champagne vinegar, and a squeeze of lemon juice. Also serve these, if you will, with some wedges of lemon. People like lemon and okra. Stir this all up. This you can make the day before and get all the flavors melded together. It's a very delicious remoulade. So we have right here a platter and some remoulade sauce. You can just put the first batch of okra here. Don't forget to sprinkle it with salt while it's still hot. And then dip it in your remoulade and taste. Mmm, really, really good. I think that batch is for me. You can make all the rest for you. Mm -hmm.